I uh, want to thank the uh, moderators and sages for the invitation to discuss about endoscopic uh, findings. Um, these are my disclosures, not uh, relevant to this talk. And since they're brief, I'm going to move on. Uh, I will present the uh, preoperative assessment for GERD, and I'm going to frame this into three different categories. Uh, first, patients with native uh, anatomy who are interested uh, to uh, consider anti-reflux surgery. Then patients who have symptoms after previous anti-reflux surgery. And then finally, for patients who have uh, uh, complaints with uh, altered gastrointestinal uh, uh, anatomy, possibly considering uh, treatment for those uh, symptoms. Uh, at first, and this seems to be a very popular uh, clip, I've, I've seen it a couple of uh, times today, but uh, at, at first, uh, endoscopy can help us really establish the diagnosis uh, of GERD for, for many patients. So the findings of Barrett's esophagus or esophagitis or peptic stricture can be diagnostic uh, for, for many patients. Now, the peptic stricture, and I'm not really going to talk about that for the, you know, the, the remainder of my slides, but that should be in the setting of uh, typical symptoms and the absence of other diseases that could be causing a stricture, uh, either malignancy or uh, uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. So as long as those things are not present, it is uh, fair to assume that uh, a stricture would be uh, diagnostic for, uh, for GERD in, in, uh, in that patient. Um, when we evaluate uh, someone uh, uh, and, and we see findings of esophagitis, the, the most common grading uh, uh, score that we use is, is uh, the uh, Los Angeles classification. It goes from grade A through grade D. And, and really, the important part is to differentiate grade C and D from grade A and, and B. Um, and uh, we do this depending on the, uh, the, the extent of the mucosal breaks uh, between, should be between the tops of at least two uh, mucosal fall, uh, falls. And that's important because um, grade A and B esophagitis can be seen in up to 25% of patients with uh, normal esophageal acid exposure. So it's not specific enough to be diagnostic, uh, but the same is not true for the more severe diseases of, uh, or at these stages of esophagitis. Uh, so it's important to uh, make this distinction when we're uh, either assessing someone ourselves or um, looking through someone else's endoscopic evaluation of a patient. Even in the absence of uh, esophagitis, histologically confirmed Barrett's esophagus is also uh, diagnostic for reflux disease now. There are uh, some differences between different guidelines, uh, whether it has to be long-term esophagus, uh, uh, long um, segment uh, is, uh, Barrett's esophagus that uh, suggest um, a GERD, but most guidelines, including the SAGES guideline for the treatment of GERD, suggest that if you have Barrett's esophagus more than one centimeter, that's histologically confirmed, that is diagnostic for uh, reflux disease. Now, uh, Barrett's esophagus is not the same from patient to patient, so for both the initial evaluation and subsequent uh, surveillance endoscopies, uh, we need to uh, very thoroughly and carefully evaluate the um, pathologic segment to rule out any uh, uh, dysplasia. And this requires four quadrant biopsies every one to two uh, centimeters, at least for the first uh, evaluation. It may be um, every one, depending what the findings of the first evaluation are. But uh, that will then uh, allow us to see if a patient has dysplasia. Now, if there's any finding of dysplasia that needs to be uh, histologically confirmed with a, uh, a second pathologist uh, to be certain about the uh, extent and, and grade of that disease. So after confirmation, we have now a patient with Barrett's esophagus, GERD, Typically, in, in, in um, our institution, that would get ablated first with uh, RFA and sometimes EMR of um, uh, suspicious areas within the Barrett segment, and then the patient would uh, proceed with, um, with uh, uh, anti-reflux surgery uh, following that. But there's other reports where uh, the timing may vary at different institutions, even done concurrently with anti-reflux surgery or following, uh, following that. Uh, this was, uh, I, I, I took this picture from the uh, SAGES forget uh, 
uh, master's group, and it's a slide from yesterday, uh, and a lot of people commented on it, and the conclusion from the session was that really any approach to fund duplication selection is justified by evidence, whether it's Nissen for all, to pay for all, or um, a tailored approach based on individual characteristics, there's enough evidence that, uh, to suggest that all, all, any of those uh, methodologies and approaches to patient selection would be uh, appropriate. But if you are tailoring your um, approach based on uh, selection, uh, patient selection and specific characteristics, I think keeping in mind um, whether that patient has Barrett's esophagus, especially long segment esophagus, uh, since that is much more likely to, um, it's a much higher risk feature compared to a short segment esophagus, uh, that may factor into your decision making if you uh, are making um, a, a patient tailored approach in the uh, degree of an application. Uh, other findings on endoscopy that I think can change management, uh, under, you know, undigested food, and we mentioned a little bit about gastroparesis, but if I'm doing an endoscopy on someone and I see uh, this, which is not uh, super pleasant, but thankfully it's not very common, then I question, I mean, did you really, when did you eat last? And if this was an hour ago, then it would explain it. But if it's not, uh, then I usually will get a gastric emptying study in a patient who has native anatomy. If they've had a previous uh, gastrectomy, it may get a little bit more complicated. But I usually will get a gastric emptying study, both to establish the diagnosis of gastroparesis if it's present, and also get a measure of the severity. Because oftentimes patients may have symptoms suggestive of gastroparesis and reflux, and you really have to figure out, well, is your pylorus causing the problem, the LES, or both, and what should we address first? And that's where trying to see, well, what's bothering you the most, and, and uh, feedback from all the other testing that we mentioned can come into uh, play. Um, other findings uh, that uh, I have seen that could change management, uh, malignancy, uh, incidental malignancy is not very common uh, during endoscopy, but it's not uh, unheard of. Um, this is a patient who I saw for uh, reflux disease. They have a small hiatal hernia, as you can see on the, on the top uh, right image, but then upon close inspection, they had this uh, lesion on the lesser curve relatively close to the GE junction, and it came up as a primary chromocytoma of the stomach, which I had never uh, heard before, but um, it prompted for this patient to uh, get a gastrectomy, uh, subtotal gastrectomy and hiatal hernia repair, and both her reflux and this lesion were, uh, were addressed. Um, peptic ulcer disease is not very common, mostly because a lot of these patients are already on PPIs at the time of their endoscopy. PPIs, for the most part, work pretty well. But uh, occasionally, um, you, you'll find uh, an ulcer. It's important to rule out H. pylori um, at that time, just so that prior to going into uh, further surgery for the reflux disease, that, uh, that problem is, uh, is addressed and managed. Uh, endoscopic uh, valve assessment uh, can also be very uh, useful. It can pick up small hiatal hernias not seen with direct view or with um, uh, radiographic images. The Hill classification system is what typically is used uh, for this, and it can be particularly important for patients who are considering uh, the TIF uh, procedure, endoscopic um, uh, endoscopic plication. Um, it is, and if someone offers that in their practice, if they have HIL one or two valve or and a small hiatal hernia, then they would be optimal patients uh, for it. Uh, so that that is something that you have to know um, as you're evaluating patients. And interestingly, many gastroenterologists don't um, include this in their uh, in their um, in their approach unless they're offering the TIF procedure. Um, patients who have a previous fund application who present with uh, symptoms can be a challenging population. So it's, uh, and in that, in that setting, endoscopy uh, really has, uh, can provide a lot of information that cannot be replaced uh, otherwise. Uh, it is uh, important to know what a, what a, what a normal um, wrap is supposed to uh, look like. And these are both uh, some somatics and then endoscopic views of a Nissen uh, to pay in a door uh, fund application. 
In addition, during endoscopy, and we, someone mentioned earlier, you can uh, oftentimes get a, get a pretty good idea if it's a tight wrap or not. If you're getting resistant to a diagnostic scope or any uh, puckering, any rings of the distal esophagus as the endoscope is going down, that suggests that it, it, may, be, um, it may be tight. Uh, now, we've had a, uh, Dr. Job here in 2004 uh, provided us with a very well detailed uh, endoscopic um, a description of what most fundoplications look like in patients who have no uh, symptoms. So these were collected from endoscopies of patients who were not symptomatic in terms of their GERD. Um, and I have here the three most common uh, fundoplications, at least that I encounter, Nissen, Tupé, and, and, and Dor. Um, when, I, when I see a patient who has symptoms after previous fundoplication, I think it, it's important for me to figure out where, which one of those elements is off. And when that information gets combined with uh, manometry and other tests, I think it, it is most useful to be able to say, what can we do better to fix your uh, symptoms? if we can do something better to fix our symptoms. Uh, these are examples of patients with uh, previous fundoplication. The first one you can see there is uh, absence of that, uh, of that valve. It's a complete disruption of uh, the wrap. The second uh, image, there is uh, somewhat of a residual uh, valve, almost looks like a toupee, but based on the twisting right next to it, I think it was uh, probably a failed uh, Nissen, and there's also some herniation uh, in the bottom of that same picture. And on the third picture, you see there's a uh, the pretty large hernia and then a partial disruption again over, over, over wrap. Um, this picture uh, in a patient who had a previous fundoplication suggests a slip wrap. It's a direct view and um, you see folds proximal to the fundoplication, which uh, is uh, abnormal. Now, while patients are evaluated, whether they're revisional patients or primary patients, other pathology to, to keep in mind, I briefly mentioned uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. This is uh, these uh, uh, esophageal, multiple esophageal rings are more the more typical image of it, but they may very well be, uh, be absent, um, but they, they can cause most of the symptoms that uh, a patient with GERD can have, uh, but in, you can also find this in a patient with GERD, which makes things a little bit more complicated. Um, this is a patient with white plaques that has uh, esophagitis. Again, you can have pain, dysphagia, um, and that's uh, something to keep in mind, especially patients who are taking uh, immunosuppression or even prednisone. Um, so if, if, Sometimes patients after previous fundoplication who have symptoms, the wrap may be intact, but any of those other things could be happening. This last patient here in the bottom, um, the G junction is actually not in the view, and the they had three fundoplications at the time of the endoscopy. The fundoplication was intact, but the patient had pain with swallowing, and this is actually a small uh, fistula to a, to a piece of uh, mesh. Uh, patients who have uh, symptoms of GERD or suggestive of GERD who have uh, had previous gastrectomy uh, can require some uh, further considerations. The most common previous uh, gastric surgery at this point in time is uh, either gastric bypass or, or sleeve gastrectomy. So patients with gastric bypass, it, a hiatal hernia may be able to be identified endoscopically, although for most of these patients I prefer to get a CAT scan with on-table contrast. Um, but other things that you can see, this first patient, there is a very large pouch, there's a lot of folds, uh, and there is a hiatal hernia and a bile in the pouch. The bile in the pouch is not normal, suggests so either a gastrogastric fistula or a distal obstruction or a very short uh, rule limb. Some of the very early gastric bypass patients that I have scoped have had uh, 20 and 40 centimeter uh, rule limbs, which may allow for um, bile to be in the pouch much more than someone else. Uh, but even in the absence of these things, bile of the ab in the absence of a large pouch or a hiatal hernia, on its own, bile in a gastric uh, pouch um, is is something to uh, to keep in mind for patients who have these symptoms. Um, 
Uh, candy cane syndrome, this is uh, a, a problem exclusively of patients with a gastrojejunostomy, and the uh, blind end of the gastrojejunostomy can be more dilated, the stomach can primarily empty into uh, that, uh, and so gastroesophageal secretions can pull there and then uh, um, they can reflux back into the esophagus causing uh, problems. On endoscopy, you'll see a very dilated blind end. The scope will primarily go towards the blind end and with insufflation that can become even more uh, prominent. Um, Patients who have GERD after sleeve gastrectomy, that's almost, a, that's almost like an entity on its, uh, on its own. It seems to be a fairly common occurrence. De novo GERD can be up to 30% of patients in five years. 30% can show worsening of pre-existing GERD. And it's, it's crucial to assess for structural problems or if they have uh, a nuance at Barrett's esophagus. Um, the, the verdict is still uh, out whether this is uh, as high of a risk as uh, a few of recent papers have uh, suggested, uh, but Barrett's esophagus long-term after sleeve gastrectomy could be anywhere from 1 to 20 percent. Um, so someone who has persistent GERD after sleeve, this is something to consider while they're being evaluated. Um, and endoscopy can show uh, th this is a large sleeve uh, where there's a small there's a small hiatal hernia. This is actually uh, gastritis. Um, there's bile in the uh, distal esophagus. This is Barrett's in the sleeve. Um, and for all these patients, addressing if there's any structural reason for the symptoms is, I think, uh, crucial because if there are structural problems with their sleeve, then some of the G junction targeted therapies. Uh, and aluminal or not may not be as successful. Uh, this is a patient who had heartburn uh, after sleeve gastrectomy and uh, some pain with uh, uh, postprandial pain. On endoscopy, so we were encountering a stricture in the mid sleeve that took a lot of negotiating to go uh, through. And by addressing the uh, stricture uh, endoscopically, her uh, GERD uh, went away. Um, a, a, a twist of a sleeve is, is uh, I'm, I'm still unclear if it's an anatomic or a functional problem, but instead of having a straight staple line around 9 o'clock of endoscopy, uh, that staple line may fluctuate on this patient, which is not my patient. Uh, it starts from 12 o'clock, goes to 9 o'clock, and all the way to uh, 7 o'clock. Um, th these patients, again, are, can have problems that are n not uh, identified without endoscopy, and if there's a structural issue like this, again, I don't know how targeted therapies would work uh, to address uh, their uh, symptoms. So in uh, summary, endoscopy can allow uh, sometimes for less testing. If you can establish a diagnosis, you may skip pH testing for some patients. I think it is crucial in patients with previous fundoplication or altered anatomy so that you can identify structural or, the, or even on functional problems and, and things that you can I improve on with a secondary intervention. And then I think it's important to keep other pathology uh, in mind when patients are being evaluated because it, it could change management. It's not very frequent, but it could change management. Thank you.